Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see a little bit of fog this morning. To know Halifax is to know fog. So it's good that you have a chance to see not only the sun, but a little bit of fog. But hopefully the fog will lift by the time we get to Peggy's Cove. It will. OK. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to all of you here at Pier 21 and to those of you who are far away. We start our third day with some outstanding speakers whom I'm honored to assist for the next couple of hours. Given the nature of their talks, we'll take questions of them, if time permits, after each speaker uh, concludes. These are indeed complicated times in which we find ourselves doing our level best to guide museums through whatever may come our way. Some days you wish for calm seas, literally and figuratively, but change and threats and challenge are all around us. Throughout all of this, it is you uh, who must find the path forward. Our speakers hopefully will help us today understand that path a little bit more clearly. Our first speaker this morning is Patty Rogers. He was appointed director and chief executive of the Royal Museum's Greenwich RMG in August of 2019. What a time to join a large museum. Our RMG comprises, uh, is comprised of the National Maritime Museum, the Royal Observatory, and the magnificent Queen's House, the historic clipper ship Cuddy Sark, and the, F the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Center. Previously, Patty served as Chief Executive Officer of Euronav, the world's largest independent publicly listed tanker company from, 20, uh, from 2000 to 2019. In 1984, he was admitted to practice law at uh, England and Wales before joining Bentley, Stokes, and Lawless uh, as a qualified lawyer, and in 1986 moved to Hong Kong, where his practice focused on shipping, working for Johnson, Stokes, and Masters. Patty served as a director and chairman of the International Tanker Owners Pollution Federation 2011 to 2019. He also served on the executive of the Intertanko, the Tanker Owners Business Association. And somehow, this little known fact, Patty has amassed a collection of six pairs of cowboy boots. <laughs> Patty Rogers. Well, thanks very much. Um, so this morning, I just wanted to sort of meander through um, little bits of my experience and some of the problems that I think um, really face us if we're going to try and manage a certain consistent approach to a difficult topic like maritime. It seems to me that maritime is something to do with the ocean and something to do with communities and people. But it's always a little bit mercurial. And that some of us have very vast ranging collections and we have a number of people who have very passionate and different interests in it. And so we're always at risk that we kind of get driven from one thing to the next, from pillar to post, and, we, uh, and therefore we risk lacking consistency and lacking a kind of guiding star for what it is that we really want to achieve and what we really want to do. Right at the heart of it, though, for me, is this concept of how we deal with long-dated problems and remote problems how the individual gets driven by what they want in a way that means that they don't pay attention to other people's needs and how it easy it is as a human being to be avoidant of dealing with difficult ethical questions. So what I've put up here is, uh, and by the way, nothing that I say today are the opinions of the National Maritime Museum or of uh, Royal Museums Greenwich or indeed of anybody else in my staff. These are purely personal, uh, just things that I want to get off my chest. So the, for a long time, it seemed to me that if we wanted to take a big picture, there were only really three things that we needed to worry about. The first one, of course, is habitability of the Earth. And uh, I want to make a point about this later on, but um, uh, we'll skip over it for the moment. Diversity, and by that, I mean, we talk about inclusion, diversity. What we're really talking about is a celebration of difference. Having a culture and approach which appreciates people being different from you. Take interest in it, be curious, not to be resistant or obstinate. And the last, and uh, very telling for this new 18th century that we live in, the new Georgian era, is disparity of wealth. Because there is no question that societies where there is a great disparity of wealth are societies that are inherently unhappy. Both the rich are unhappy, 
and the poor are unhappy. And they are high-risk societies. They are always volatile and at risk of disruption. So these are really big things that we could think about. And if we always made sure we reflected them in our work, there'd be a consistency of relevance. People would come and they would understand and they would see and think and they would feel that there was something in there, no matter what period of the collection, no matter what period of the past, there'd be something that touched on the present and that was moving and important. And our job, more than anything else, is to facilitate changing the conversation. It's about trying to make that non-threatening, accessible, and making people think about doing things differently. Because whatever got us here will not get us where we need to go. And at the heart of that change in the conversation, of course, is culture. What I've put up here is a one-way conversation, I think. That's certainly, um, uh, what could we call that? It's, uh, it's definitely not dialogue. And it sums up the critical problem of the human being when they come to consciousness. I know other animals have levels of consciousness, but the only species that we're aware of that has a critical sense of self that is deeply isolating is humans. And whilst it leads to imagination, it gives a strong sense of individualism, it can also create the terror of isolation. I've put Hamlet here because uh, in, in literary circles it's suggested that the first time in literature that the question of taking your life was debated in a play by somebody who didn't know whether to act or to die. Oh, what a piece of a work is a man. The loss of confidence, the sudden crisis. So balance there, that huge sense of individualism that can be so powerful and strong in us and the vulnerability it can create at the same time. When it's demeaned, that individualism simply becomes transactional a culture of ownership, of possessing, of dominance, of control, of wanting to be the empowered voice, of wanting to be the person that will tell everybody else how it should be. But humans were given two ears and one mouth, and we should listen twice as much as we speak. And of course, Plato's great comment, a life without reflection is a life not worth living. And I can tell you a nasty little horror story to go with that, which is that my daughter, who, my older of my two daughters, works um, in mental health and uh, worked for a while looking after a man who had no significant memory. Within an hour or two, everything that happened to him, he forgot. And that is a terrible thing to witness. A man whose life would know neither hope nor despair. And of course, that's not what we're in. We're in the business of remembering and we're in the business of dialogue. Our common needs, how do we escape that? What do, we, what do humans need more than anything else? They need community. They need relationships. Why? Because those relationships, collaboration and involvement, behind it is a desire to transcend the individualism, to transcend the temporary nature of your life. As a bit of a spoiler coming, you're all going to die. And humanity has an end date, and we know what the end date of humanity is. I'll come to that shortly. What we're trying to do in the meantime is to be happy and just and fair and make the most of our lives. And we can do that either through transcending our individualism, through building families, through generational legacy, through having children, a compelling urge in humans and in all life forms but also across into communities, other people, shared perspectives, sense of community. One hand washes the other. And culture is a critical part of that transcendence. And the objects that we collect effectively become lodestones for that transcendence where perspectives are shared and where you can find commonality with other human beings. And in that dialogue, you can break your isolation. Now, we like to talk a lot and we always, you will always hear Darwin quoted, and people think they understand evolution. Darwin is probably the most misquoted person in history because people say that he taught a theory of survival of the fittest. Now that is a lost culture war because that is not what he said. He said it was survival of the most adaptable. 
And the idea of the fittest was turned into the idea of a strong person or of an individual. But in fact, the most adaptable was often in a community. And this was something that the uh, biologist Kropotkin, who was an anarchist in the, uh, in the Russian Revolution, made the point. He had lived closely with nature, and he had said that actually, nature's very cooperative, and species cooperate across all the time in ecosystems that are complex. And if we look at the little picture I've got there, that's the worldwide wood. wood. It's the internet of the forest. I don't know if any of you have read the books on it recently or some of the research done on it, but uh, woods, in a wood, uh, trees will share nutrients, and that sharing of nutrients between the trees is organized uh, by the, uh, the, the, um, the, the fungi uh, embedded in the earth. And so it shows you that, in fact, a lot of the things that we think about the way we should be are not actually the way that they are. And we have to open ourselves to those possibilities. But this is conceptual to some extent. Here's a very practical one, because this is Willem Anders' photograph uh, on the Apollo 8 uh, voyage. He said, uh, we went to the moon and discovered the Earth. They went to the dark side of the moon and they saw Earth rise. And at that moment, for the first time, a human being had seen Earth from outside and realized that we really are all in it together. There is no alternative. It's not just a cultural issue that we're in community. It is a damn fact that we all live on this planet together. And it's the Goldilocks planet. In the habitable zone, around a star, we have three planets that are in the habitable zone. That means they're not too hot and they're not too cold. Venus has a sulfur-rich atmosphere, through, and has globally warmed, is even hotter than Mercury. And Mars has no magnetosphere and has no atmosphere, and it's a desolate and blasted place. Why anybody would imagine that humanity will escape to Mars when we can't make enough of a mess of Earth for it to be as bad as that? just seems crazy to me, but Elon Musk, have it your own way. And why is it the habitable planet? Why is it the Goldilocks planet? Not too hot and not too cold? Well, partly because of its position in relation to the sun, but also because of the magic of the ocean, the distributor of heat. Now, I've got a little warning for you. This diagram is not drawn to scale. Although, in 300 million years' time, that will happen and Earth will end because the sun will go into its dying phase and expand and expand and eventually take up all of the planets. So there's an end date for humanity. But in the meantime, we have this wonderful ocean which distributes heat. And as it distributes heat, it creates weather, it creates currents, and those currents become roads, like whale roads, through the ocean, carrying life forms, distributing them around the world. And the first mariners that went to sea relied on those currents to take them where they wanted to go. It was only later we developed technology to steer ourselves, but still they're powerful. And those, of course, are in a process of change. The ocean, the connecting ocean, the object that's in all of our museums and that connects every human being. It is a fantastic thing to make sure that it is in your museum. That people understand that all the technology and the cultures you look at are connected through this one thing and that we bring it back into vision all the time. And this wonderful print of Hokusai really evokes the sense of the way that you feel and emote to something. It's an object that transcends personal and individual experience. It gives the object uh, the object becomes, and this is a word that I've recently learned to love, numinous. I think we should all practice saying it. It's that sort of, uh, the object that has become sacred. Not holy, not religious, but it's so important to us that we all share an attachment to it and it elevates us. It transcends us out of our individual and personal life. So one of our clearly shared objectives is how we evoke the ocean in our museums. Now, I really do sound like somebody who's swallowed a copy of the Reader's Digest or has read far too many colour supplements in his, in his Sunday papers. So I want to break out a little bit now and look at some slightly harder examples within my shipping experience of how we always have this tension between being the individual and being the many, the I and the we. So let's have a look at the culture of the market because one of the things that people don't understand is how much the market, and it's a great tool, 
drives human interaction. Barter and trade are good things. They are often misused. And that's one of the things that we always have to be able to separate out. You know, when we look at colonization as a process, which is trade at the point of a gun, it's not the market's fault. It's not trade's fault. So when we see duress being used in negotiation, or we see the markets incorrectly priced, it's not the market's fault. It's a tool of human beings. The reason it's important not to reject it is because it works. And we've got to find systems that work and use them not to try and find new ways and reinvent the wheel all the time. Ship-owning economics is part of economics that sometimes goes mad. And it's worth evaluating that and just talking about, talking about it a little bit. And then I want to talk a bit about crewing, the team building that goes on board ship, where the I really does transcend to the we if we want to have a well-operated and safe ship. And I want to have a look at two objects that are in our collection, or two types of object, and talk about them. So, give me one second. I'm sure, I'm sure you're all well aware that um, ships don't move cargo. Cargo moves ships. So, nobody drives a ship from one place to another unless it's in the expectation of making money and of making that money from carrying goods or people in a way that will be beneficial to them or they believe will be beneficial to them. The way that that's traditionally done is through what we call an arbitrage. When goods go into oversupply in one area, and they, uh, the price, of course, will go down. When they go in undersupply in another, the price will go up. And when the gap between those prices is greater than the cost of freight, the cost of loading on board a ship and carrying and burning fuel in order to deliver it, the markets geographically unite. So two separate markets will suddenly, because of geographic location, will unite as a result of the ocean and as a result of shipping trade. And as they unite, the arb will then drop. And it should flatten out, and then it will reappear again when goods go into supply in one place and prices fall, and when goods go into undersupply in another and prices rise. And this is the basis of all shipping. It is regularly misused. Uh, with the most famous case which will come up around the Cutty Sark, although the Cutty Sark never carried opium, there's a great book on this, by the way, called An Insular Possession by Timothy Moe about the granting of Hong Kong as a result of the Opium War. But there was a dislocation in trade because the Chinese would not allow foreign goods into the country, but there was a huge hunger for their tea, and they demanded silver. They would only be paid in silver. So um, the Western powers effectively set up a counter trade, which was illegal, to sell opium into China in order and demanded silver in payment. And this created a balance in the, in the trade surplus and deficit. And so the trade was able to go on until eventually it led to a war. And the effect of that war was that China was open to foreign goods and then opium was stopped as a trade. It was no longer necessary to balance trade. We've seen this as a dominant feature of the rise of Japan, the rise of Korea, and the rise of China. All three of them have been able, either through industrial conglomerates or through state control, to ensure that when goods were sold abroad, the cash that was received was not distributed within the economy generally. Why is that important? Because if it's distributed within the economy generally, then the yuan would rise against the dollar and make them uncompetitive. So when you start to export large volumes of goods to another country, of course you're acquiring their currency. And the moment that you use that currency to acquire yours, it drives your currency up, your goods become effectively uneconomic. This has been stopped in those three rises. It was stopped by the Zaibatsu conglomerates, by the family conglomerates of Korea, and by the central government in China because they balanced on the capital account. They kept their currency low by immediately buying back foreign capital assets. And this hollowed out industry in the West and affected an imbalance. This is coming to an end now, of course, as for various reasons, but not the ones that not the ones that started it. But we'll see it balance out because it can't go on forever. So trade can work, it's important, it's an essential part of human interaction, but you have to question all the time whether or not it's being done on a basis that's fair and what lies behind it. 
the culture of ship owning. I've got a picture of the Cutty Sark here because the Clippers um, demonstrated what it's like when there's a really big arb. You, you maximize sale, you maximize cargo carrying, you minimize everything else. Reduce scantlings, reduce the crew as much as you can, and you try to make sure you maximize the amount of cargo you can move at speed. And speed's important because if you have a big profit, you want to make as many as voyages as you can over the lifetime of the asset, the ship. And White Hat, White Hat Willis's comment about uh, uh, clippers, because he converted a ship from steam, the Tweed, back to being a sail ship. And his argument was that the wind is free. It's a critical comment because at this point in history, the impact on our environment of trade and the impact on our, our environment of our industrialization was relatively slight. But it's going to go through a great leap forward. And this ugly duckling is part of the cause. Uh, the use of steaming coal and taking out sail. And the reason for that, of course, was that steamships essentially were more reliable. The wind's intermittent, and this gave more resilience to the trade. But it had, it was cheap, relatively speaking. The reason, what we realize now is, it was disastrously cheap. Because the market had not priced in the damage that was being do, done to the public commons of the environment through the emission of, of uh, greenhouse gases. So this is the problem we have today. If we don't price carbon into our market trades, no amount of consumer choice, no amount of telling your public how to buy this and to do that will make any difference. There has to be a point at which there is a tax put on carbon that will equalize the trade and compensate for the damage that's done and uncounted in the marketplace. If not, consumers can turn away from hydrocarbons. But if they turn away from hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons go into long supply. There'll just be more and more and more of them getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And whoever's the poorest will find that the most difficult thing to turn their back on. And indeed, as we can see now, when you get a disruption, everybody's immediately clamoring for going into hydrocarbons again. So unless we have a deep think about it, and it won't be us that decides, you know? This is, a, this is a conversation that's being run at the World Bank and with the ship-owning communities at the moment on emissions of, uh, of, of, um, of, of carbon. I've got a good word to say for shipping before we leave this, which is just that shipping is by far the most efficient means of transport on a relative basis. I think the, for, a, for, a kilo, for a kilo of goods moved one kilometre, shipping emits about seven grams of carbon. And it's about 40 uh, for a railway. It's about 80 for a truck and it's about 600 for an aeroplane. So it's efficient, but if the goods don't need to be moved, then it's not efficient at all. If your production is based in China, when it could as well be based across the river here, then the relative cost of carbon and the cheapness in terms of environmental damage on a relative basis is unimportant. There was something that should have warned us that we were going in the wrong direction with our shipbuilding practices based on cheap carbon. And that was that we lost the golden rule. This is a brief description of what's known as a cross-block coefficient. What exactly is the shape of a hull in the water? Because that determines the amount of resistance to you moving it. Now, the blockier a ship is, the more freight it can carry, and therefore it looks economically better. But it gets more resistance, and that resistance can be monumental. But of course, in the days of sailing, when we were following golden rules of design, a hull crossbot coefficient might have been quite slight, maybe 0.6. But in the days of the super tanker like ours, it would have been more like 0.9. And that ugly shape should tell you something's wrong. Because a thing of beauty has a natural, virtuous element to it. And when you see that almost organic hull of the Cutty Sark when you go under it, it'll make you think, this looks right. And when you see a big, blocky ship, you must think something's wrong there. And it is. We're using force to overcome nature in a way that's destructive to the environment. So one of the most important relationships in shipping has to be with the crew. Because they're the people that go to sea. They're the people that bring the ship home safely. But ship owners went through a crisis of outsourcing ship management and becoming transactional in their approach to crews. We heard very nicely from the ITF yesterday about the great work they've done over this. And the idea was just all be good, but be the cheapest. 
Why? Because shipping's intermittent and sometimes I don't get any freight, so I, don't, I can't afford to have an expensive crew around costing me money. I want, to, I want to have the lowest possible break-even rate to clear the market when the market's good. But with it came risk, and the risk became intolerable. And everything changed. So we do now, courtesy of a number of important people, have um, the MLC, and we do have labour conventions, and most of the good ship owners are paying their crew on time and training them, and are trying to deal with the risk factor. Now, shipping risk in terms of sinkings and collisions, generally speaking, is going down. But the thing that's very difficult to stop on a ship is somebody doing something stupid. And I say stupid because working a lathe without a cover on it, when they've had a bulletin from their um, shore staff uh, two weeks before showing somebody losing an eye because a, a, a slither of metal went into their eye, working a lathe without a cover on it, then two weeks later they're doing the same thing and the same thing happens to them. And we used to wonder about how we could stop it. Lots of checklists, lots of telling, lots of, um, you know, you must do a toolbox talk, you must have a risk assessment, and it's all about daddy telling the child what you've got to do, and we're not getting anywhere. What we found that was critical was changing the conversation on board and creating a ship where well-being, socialization, created what we call a flourishing ship. Because what's happening on board when somebody leaves their foot hanging when a winch gear moves and they lose it is that they've stopped caring. They've stopped caring about themselves. They don't care whether they're going home next month. They've basically become depressed. So trying to make sure as a captain on board a ship, together with your officers, that you're leading a vibrant team of people who talk to each other, engaged, are not left on their own. And many of these people, you heard yesterday um, about um, uh, uh, seafarers from the Philippines who might be supporting 15 family members. Well, you know, the tragedy of that sometimes can be that they hear that one of their family members has just had a fantastic celebration or bought another car or bought another fridge. And their heart sinks because they're going to be asked to do another contract in direct continuation to support the ambitions of their community. And that's when things start to go wrong. And if you don't get into it and penetrate it, you don't see your accident record improve. So again, it's crossing that boundary, turning it into a conversation, having a community. An object that implies the ocean. Here's the Cutty Sark when she was cut down. The reason she was cut down was to slow speed her, to reduce the cost of running her, because she had dropped out of the very lucrative trades in Australia and China, and she was uh, lugging coal around uh, Africa. So then a small crew and doing six knots was fine. And so she was de-rigged, or had her spars and bars cut down. That's the object. This is the relationship. You know, the passionate follower. The two of them actually got married on board a ship. This Dalman uh, and his wife, who was a member of the Courthold family. So they had the money to indulge their passion, and they indulged their passion in rebuilding the Cutty Sark, rescuing it, and turning it into an icon. And they connected that object that transcended their experiences with an audience. And it's now moored at Greenwich, and it's really important. It's important to all the people in Greenwich because it's become a place, it's become a thing, it's not a ship anymore. It's been a ship and it tells a shipping story. But now it's a community opportunity. And you can see a youth takeover that happened on board the, the Cutty Sark. But people who will never go on board the Cutty Sark know where it is. They know that it's one of those icons of entry point as you go into, um, as you go into London. So, a new meaning and a new making of place. At the Queen's House, this is a drawing by Van der Velde, the Elder, by the way. And he was, um, he was taken as an artist at the Queen's House by Charles II. And this is a sketch of his of a battle in the Anglo-Dutch War, probably at Scaveningen, I think. And um, he's the first embedded war correspondent, which I heard Ma Michael mention to you yesterday. There's a little picture of him at work with the hat on sketching away in battle. But he had a son. And his son didn't have the same acuity or the same experience of being at sea and drawing. 
but he was a great painter. And for him, the ocean wasn't a place where ships fought battles, what he had watched. But the, ship had, but the ocean had transcended in his paintings to be about the vicissitudes of life, about an emotional, powerful metaphor for what it is to be a human being, struggling against your isolation in all your desperate turmoils. This isn't really a story of two ships. This is a story of human struggle. And it's the start of a different way of interpreting and a different way of painting. And it leads us in a long line of connection through to this lovely painting that we have from Kehinda Wiley, A Ship of Fools, where the ocean and the boat become metaphors for those struggles that human beings are in, those three big things that I talked about at the start. So culture can act in two ways. To me, it seems that I'm a very complicated person. I know the moods that I have, the changes in temperament, the minor frustrations, the agonies, all the different decisions that go through my head. I'm very complicated. But I only know you through your actions, through your words, through the clothes you're wearing now, not the ones you didn't put on today, which I'm still thinking about. Why didn't I pack a pair of cowboy boots? Would have gone nicely with this tie, you know. But they are home. These complexities that I have and the simplicities that you have, what am I to do with it? If culture tries to make me say there's something wrong with me, that I should be simple like I see you acting and behaving, and I should block thoughts out, and I should not have that idea, and I shouldn't have done that and think about this, I should be more simple, I should be more direct, I need to set my alarm for six o'clock and get up every morning, and I need to go for a run, and I need to be like this, and I need to be like that. Then this is culture being used to control, to make you submit, to make you conform. And that can be important, but be careful. That's the culture that's used in the army, it's the culture that's used in the police force, it's the culture that was used in the SS. So be careful, because culture's not always good, right? Look at this picture here. This is very much the concept that the founder of the uh, Maritime Museum had when he set it up in 37, which was that a young man would be shown a simple example of Nelson and should aspire to being the warrior who dies in battle. And the person who's telling him to be like that is his mother. What a shocking idea. They're not talking about Nelson who went to sea at 12, who must have been lonely, who have had to go through his sexual development as a young man on board a ship of 700 people, who was brave enough to fall in love, courageous in battle, clever, thoughtful. That's not the Nelson people want to talk about. They want to talk about a war hero, a simple cartoon of a character. If we use culture well, then we focus on our empathy. We take our complexity, and I look at you and know Every complexity that I have, you have too. I could be interested in the struggles you had, whether you have a pair of cowboy boots that haven't been fixed. I could be curious. I could use culture to share, to collaborate, and to have a dialogue. And then all of a sudden, the world's become an incredibly rich place. And what do we give to our visitors who go through this process? We give them a way of understanding themselves, giving them a, self, a sense of self-respect, enjoyment, a sense of place in the world, which isn't dependent on their ability to buy, that isn't dependent upon the things that other people have given them, but is something that they can construct for themselves. And I know that because I can see what I've heard from all of you, passionate individuals who have built for yourselves identities, relationships, and friendships around the things that matter to you. You didn't buy them in a shop. You bought them with thinking, talking, working, being active, all the things that make life really worth living. I think it's inherent on us that we don't get too obsessed with having answers for things. I've got a last slide, which was just actually a list of me telling you what to do. But I'm not going to do that. I think, <laughs> of course, what I want to say is, you know, Life's not a crossword puzzle. There isn't an answer. There isn't one glorious solution, an answer to everything. There isn't a list that will be complete, and at the end of it, we'll have done everything. There's just lots of questions to have, 
and lots of conversations to have. And that's really what we're doing here and why the Congress is so important, but it's also really important that we always carry that with us when we're at home. Thank you all very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Steve, are we going to defer the questions? I'm not doing karaoke. I'm not. Whoa, there we go. okay, good morning, everybody, again. Thank you, Patty. Extraordinary talk, and thank you for sharing such a personal journey with us. I felt like I was back in school. I had a combination of an economics class, philosophy, and history all in one. And I particularly appreciate um, this idea of culture that you shared with us. And I, my question for you to get things started is, how did you come to the content of this talk today? What, what, what inspired you? Is it, was it reading? Was it Hamlet? What was it that brought you to having this outlook uh, about your life and about culture itself? Uh, uh, it, I, I think it's been in the back of my mind for a long time. I, it wasn't an accident that I ended up at the uh, museum because I've always been interested in... Um, in culture, um, but uh, I think that I first started thinking about it because, and it, this is a very long time ago, when I was at school, I was uh, part of a debating team, and we lost the debate to a school from an, a, a neighboring school on the subject of art more important than science. And I was defending the arts against the sciences and lost the debate. And my word, that hurt. Because, you know, and I just want to, I want to make this point because it is really, really important. Whenever you, a lot of leading politicians these days will talk about technology. And they'll talk about um, how uh, artificial proteins uh, are going to save the day, how this is going to save the day, how that technology is going to save the day, how things just get better and better. But this isn't saving the day. You know, if we don't focus on social justice and the path to understanding other human beings is through the arts. Because social justice is critical to solving anything. We don't have a shortage of food in this world. We just don't know how to share it. We don't have an inability to make things. We make plenty of stuff. We just don't know how to look after it. And whilst I'm not wearing cowboy boots, but I am wearing a bootlace tie, I will tell you that the head of the Hunk Papa Sioux, Sitting Bull, became part of Wild Bill Cody's circus and ended up going around Europe. And his comment, apparently, it might be apocryphal, but why share, ruin a good story? Apparently his comment was, you know how to make things, but you don't know how to share them. Boy, you are full of poignant <laughs> phrases today. I'm, I'm really glad to know that life is not a crossword puzzle, uh, but because um, you know, I do get frustrated with them from time to time. How about another question for Patty in the back? Oh, Marika, can we get a microphone to Marika? Uh, I also want to thank you for a fantastic and very personal talk. And as a former historian of ideas, I uh, appreciate your take on, on the culture. But I have a question for you, and that is, we represent a global museum community. And the uh, call to arms that you've now given us to, uh, in museums, um, take a responsibility for a discussion about fairness and equality and, and uh, reflecting diversity through self and so forth. I found uh, in my museum experience that that uh, doesn't ring true with all uh, nations and uh, the way museums are set up in all cultures. 
because for some uh, cultures, museums might be about building a sense of uh, national pride uh, or about uh, rewriting history. So, for example, the um, museum experience of South Africa has been quite turbulent in the past 15 years. What stories do you tell? And so, how would your uh, really interesting uh, focus uh, on a particular perspective uh, ring true across the world? And I know you have global experience through shipping, so yeah. I think you'd be well equipped to answer this question. <laughs> well, I, I hope I won't be too quick, because I, uh, the, the, um, I think one of the things I do want to make clear, and I, I'm really glad you asked the question, is that please don't go back to the museum and write a, a motif under your museum's name saying socially just institution. Uh, or I think that the, the, the thing that we can do, and, and I think this is the thing that's useful, uh, and everybody can do it, is just to um, show power structures in conversations. So that if you're talking about something, you might have a, you know, so it, it, nobody should be changing an exhibition particularly, but if you went to look at uh, Van der Velde, then, uh, or a painting, you might want to just pull away a little bit about what's the, what was the nature of the power slope between the paint, the artist, and the, and, and the employer? What was the relationship between art and the general public at that time? Could it be seen? Or, so those sorts of... The, the way to, to tease this out is, is not to be coming in um, with a very strong view about what's right or wrong. We're not here to do 1066, you know, the Norman conquest was a good thing, or that the British Empire was a bad thing. I mean, you don't need to explain that. But you do need to say, this happened, that happened, that those people didn't like that. We might have thought it was good, but they didn't like it. And I think you have to tease away and pull at it. I think that uh, if you're in, I mean, and you said in national pride, the, um, the person who used that picture of Nelson to imagine what the Maritime Museum would be like, said something in, his, um, uh, in one of his introductions to it, which was to the museum, was that uh, because I believe that um, a ship in the hands of a British man uh, will be better exploited in the hands than in the hands of any other nation. Well, you know, I work very closely, most of my working life with Greeks. I can't imagine anybody being closer to the sea or having a better understanding of how to sail a ship than a Greek. And uh, I... Uh, Many of you are from the archipelago or from the Baltic. I mean, this is this crazy. It's just crazy. And, and, and you are really tested as a, an institution if you have people wanting you to say these things, which are nonsense. But I don't really think there is. I, I mean, certainly in, this, in, in our countries, I, I think we have arguments publicly, and they can be very difficult, and they can go to funding. I'm sure there are countries where you can go to prison. I mean, uh, if, a, if a woman can go to prison for getting behind a driving wheel of a car in Saudi Arabia, um, th there's no hope for a museum there, is there? But what can we do? We can't answer questions. We just have to pose them. One final question you wish to pose? Just. Buddy, thank you very much indeed. Most inspiring and most inspirational. Uh, I have a rather profane question about one of the slides that you showed. It's a ship portrait, and I think I saw the American flag, the Dutch flag, and I think the flag St. George, but I'm not really sure about that one. Uh, when it comes to uh, celebrating differences, it might be a wonderful symbol of how various nations work together on one ship. I'm not really particularly sure whether you meant it that way, but can you elaborate a little bit on what we saw there? Thank you. Well, you were talking about the... Uh, uh, absolutely not, because I'm by no means a historian, a curator, or indeed a man of any specific knowledge whatsoever. What I, what I could say is that I think we showed a... Uh, you mean the one that was a uh, dual fuel ship? It had sails and uh, an early steam engine. Yeah, and the only reason I chose it was just for that dual fuel image, because the SS Great Britain. there you go. <laughs> the man himself, it's the SS Great Britain. Yeah, there you go. So for me, as you know, I'm a man devoid of knowledge. It's, uh, it was, it's more the, um, the, the interest for me was actually, in, and, and if you don't mind me having one minute longer, the thing that was so interesting to me is that <clears throat> uh, uh, sail, I mean, we heard... So the first steam engine put on board a ship was in Greenwich, in Deptford. We'll call it Greenwich, but it's near enough. Uh, uh, I think by William Penn. 
and, the, uh, and certainly there was Penn steam engines were, were built in Deptford. And then they were used for tugging and all the rest of it. But that was, it. I think it was the 1820s. And we heard yesterday of Ericsson's fleet, a lot, their last commercial uh, sale grain deliveries in 45. 49, was it, Kevin? So, I mean, this battle between um, uh, which, is the, you know, which, was the, which fuel was going to win out, it's an incredibly long period of time over which it played out. And uh, it, it's worth remembering just because um, it's not so fantastical that we go back to accepting intermittency through solar or wind and that we use them in commercial shipping. Good. Thank you.